My name is Ellie Lee, and I'm a volunteer for Gyopo, the organization that is co-presenting with MOCA Los Angeles, tonight's very special screening of Community of Parting by Jane Jen Kaizen. The screening will be followed by a conversation and Q&A with Jane, moderated by Crystal Munhe Bick. I'd like to quickly share a little bit about Gyopo before I introduce Jane, the film, and Crystal. Gyopo is a coalition of diasporic Korean cultural producers and art professionals based in Los Angeles, seeking to address issues within contemporary art, culture, and social justice through impactful programming and community alliances. We were established in 2017, and last year we became a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, and what we do is we aim to strike a balance between pr providing free public forums for cross-cultural, intergenerational, and intersectional multi-issue um, discussions such as this um, tonight and dedicated spaces for people of the Korean diaspora. We're completely volunteer run, so if you're interested in contributing any of your skills and time, please get in touch. Um, we're honored to have this opportunity to share Jane Jin Kaizen's film with Los Angeles tonight. Jane is an artist who works across video installation, film, photography, performance, and text. Her work is informed by interdisciplinary engagements and includes perspectives of individuals working in a wide range of fields, including shamans, artists, political philosophers, anthropologists, and historians. She's based in Berlin and Copenhagen and received an MFA from UCLA and, and an MA from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts, where she's currently a PhD candidate in artistic research. She's one of three artists who represented South Korea in the 2019 Venice Biennale and has participated in the Liverpool, Gwangju, Onren, and Je Jeju Biennales, among others. She's exhibited extensively internationally and has shown films in numerous international film festivals. Um, but a few upcoming projects um, include an exhibition at the Kunsthal uh, Charlottenburg in Denmark um, and art so uh, an exhibition at Art Sonje Center in Korea, as well as a film screening at Palais, uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris. So uh, watch out for those things. And uh, until tonight, the film that you're going to see has only been presented as a part of an installation in the Korean Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Uh, and in Venice, this film was um, presented as a two-channel video installation. But tonight, you'll be seeing a single-channel iteration of the film. Uh, the shape-shifting nature of this project might be something Jane and Crystal touch upon in their conversation following the film. Crystal. Beck is an assistant professor of gender and sexuality studies at UC Riverside and is published widely in journals and anthologies. Her first sole authored book, Reencounters on the Korean War and Diasporic Memory Critique, came out last year. Jane and Crystal have known each other for quite a few years, so we're very lucky to have them here together to discuss things such as decolonial aesthetics as it relates to Korea and Jeju Island the theme of borders, translation, subjectivity, and dissidence that are all crucial to Jane's work. So stick around. We're gonna go straight into the conversation and Q&A after the screening. And thank you for being here on a Friday night. Please silence all of your cell phones because it's Friday night, so I'm sure you're all receiving texts and calls. So thank you very much and enjoy the film. Thank you so much for coming out tonight um, for this amazing screening. Um, I want to thank Kyopo for organizing um, this event and also thank MOCA for hosting the screening. Of course, thank Jane Jin Kaizen for uh, making this incredible film. Um, so before we officially launch into our conversation, we just want to uh, make a few notes. Do you want to go yes, first? Yes, and yeah, I would also like to thank uh, Kyopo. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to show the film in, in this context, and also thank you to Moke. Uh, and especially, um, I wanted to thank uh, some of the participants in the film who are present here tonight. 
So uh, Patty Ann, who's one of the voice narrators uh, in the film, and Daniel Sachs, who um, did the aerial cinematography uh, concept and who was part of uh, filming uh, a lot for the film, both in, in Korea with the ritual and in the US. Um, and there's a few other people, uh, Heso Kim and Siti Lin, who have been part of uh, uh, the filming and research for the film as well and maybe others, and yeah. We'll mention so, them throughout yeah, um, the yeah. evening. Um, so we also want to acknowledge and note that um, we're having a conversation, um, a brief conversation, but we also want to note that um, we really see this conversation as an entry point to having a deeper conversation with all of you. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, so maybe I'll just start with a really general question and ask you, Jane, if you can talk a little bit about um, the title of the film, um, mm -hmm. Community of Party. Yes. So let's just start there. Yeah, so the title actually derives from um, a South Korean uh, poet and writer, Kim Hae Soon. Uh, whose work I've been very inspired by. Uh, she bases her poetics around uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of her, um, she, she has created this feminist poetics, uh, which largely is also drawing from uh, the myth of party. Um, and so community of parting is a line uh, from one of her books. Um, and which I thought was very telling of uh, the piece as a whole. Um, I also think about the uh, shamanic ritual, in a sense, uh, as gathering a community of parting. So when the shaman is um, performing a ritual, uh, in some ways it's, it's, it's about a gathering of um, both the living and the dead. And it's it's a very momentary um, uh, gathering, um, and then I think the title also speaks to uh, a community of of dispersal, in a sense, to some of the many diasporic experiences mm. that are also part of the piece. Mm. So maybe in the spirit of that, and dovetailing with your um, answer, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the collaborations that were part and parcel of this film, including with the shaman who's featured yeah. in this film. Yeah, yeah, so there were many different uh, individuals who played a large role in, in making uh, this piece. And first of all, uh, Siamen Kusunan, uh, who recurred in the film. Uh, and she uh, is a Siamen, or was a Siamen, she unfortunately passed away a few weeks. Um, after the film was completed, but uh, I had known her since 2011, and we formed a, an intimate relationship um, over the years. She was, as I mean, some of her story is um, explained in the film, but she um, she lived in Jeju Island uh, in the su in the southern part of uh, Korea, and um, she. I've been observing many different rituals over the years, but I think one of the things that really struck me about her practice as a shaman was that she was very dedicated to the memory of um, the Jeju April 3rd massacre that took place in Jeju, uh, also because her uh, family was victimized uh, during that time. Um, so somehow in her shamanic practice, it was really important to um, recall uh, that memory. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I would say f most of all the uh, individuals who uh, were part of the film or who reflect the myth of Pari in different ways um, are uh, people I've known uh, for quite a long time and um, who um, somehow Th their stories or experiences um, really struck me, and I thought they would, um, like in different ways, they really uh, expanded on, on, on the myth. Um, mm. 
And you know, I wonder if it might be also helpful for the audience um, if we talk just a little bit about Jeju Island because it's such a particular um, place within mm -hmm. your work. Um, so I don't. Did you want to start with that? And yeah, sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's. Um, I think this piece, um, in many ways, uh, different stories or uh, histories are um, presented, but not. Uh, uh, it, it, sometimes it's, it's just hinted at and mm -hmm. um, uh, the whole context is not necessarily explained um, and that's something that I've dealt with in previous works for example with um, the history of Jeju Island um, and um, it was really I mean a lot of the nature scenes in the piece um, and also from where the shaman is practicing mm -hmm. is Jeju Island and some, somehow that is significant within the context of um, uh, Korean modern history and the division of Korea because Jeju was um, the um, how can you say it um, uh, Shortly before uh, the outbreak of the Korean War, there was um, this massacre in Jeju Island. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and part of why that took place was that um, uh, Jeju as a region, or as a province, uh, was the only province uh, that denied um, uh, a, a separate South Korean First state. Division. So because of that, um, there was a retaliation against um, mm -hmm. the island as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it plays a large role in terms of uh, under what do you mean? Well, well I mean, it's uh, <laughs> um, do you want to elaborate on that? Um, um, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you afterwards as well. Um, but I, I also want to really honor the space that um, we're in right now and honor the work that um, Jane has done. Um, so I mean, I think what is important, um, as Jane noted, when we um, think about um, Jeju Island, it's an island that's um, literally directly south of the Korean Peninsula, has had um, a very long tumultuous history of, of multiple colonialisms and militarization and um, the event that Jane just spoke to, um, the Jeju Island uh, Massacre, which is often referred to as the Sasam or 4.3 Massacre, um, was um, a seven-year massacre roughly, 1948 to 1955, um, and um, was a massacre that was really um, instigated in many ways by sort of anti-communist forces um, in, in uh, Jeju Island uh, led by the South Korean interim government um, as well as um, anti-communist youth groups that were um, trained by the South Korean state as well as the US. So this is sort of a backdrop I think that is important um, when we consider um, sort of the multiple um, narratives and stories that you do explore um, in this particular um, film. So thank you for um, responding to that. So maybe um, segueing with that, I wonder if you can talk, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, sort of your body of work in the past 10 years, um, thinking about an earlier film, The Woman, the Orphan, and the Tiger, um, thinking about dissident translations, which is um, is sort of a multimedia um, exhi exhibit that includes installations as well as films and of course um, this work. And as different as these works are, I think there are sort of themes and com um, concepts that emerged across these different works. So I think of borders, um, translation, uh, militarization as well. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the significance of borders and translation um, within this particular work, both as sort of literal concepts that you take up, but also as part of your artistic practice? Sure. Um, 
I mean, I think in many ways this piece emerged for me um, after um, uh, participating in, in an event which uh, dealt with um, meeting women's groups in uh, North Korea and South Korea back in 2015. And in many ways, encountering um, how the I mean how the division of Korea uh, still resonates mm -hmm. very much in the present I mean in the context of Korea but also um, amongst the diaspora and how it still plays a role uh, you know in in terms mm -hmm. of uh, global politics but also oftentimes how um, borders I mean there's tendency to um, uh, for polarized views to, mm -hmm. um, you know, just um, manifest themselves and, and be stuck, you know, so, so you know, how to, I, I think it really made me want to think about other ways of addressing borders, um, and that was when uh, the myth of Pari uh, mm -hmm. to me became really significant because in some ways, it's it's a it's a myth about uh, a figure that is at the borders. It's a threshold figure mm -hmm. that is neither on one side nor the other, and and that is the space from which uh, she mediates. Mm -hmm. um, and within that practice of mediation, it's about establishing forms of recognition across. Mm -hmm. You know, so so the necessity of of that kind of perspective or that kind of angle on 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 histories that otherwise are very um, mm -hmm. hardened, um, mm -hmm. and I think that may, maybe I mean I think the question of, of of borders has has run across as you said different works and I've uh, sought it out um, uh, in other ways in the in the past, but but this for this piece for me perhaps was also. Um, I mean, really, uh, an attempt maybe to come to terms with um, with that kind of polarity and try to, I mean, find ways of um, uh, not, I mean, not necessarily uh, reconciliating it in 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 formal terms, you know. But but I think that is a process that that is. Is part of, I mean, what what the myth sort of describes, um, and what I perhaps see as like individual processes that are taking place um, mm -hmm. in the in the piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what's so powerful about this work is um, when you take up this sort of theme of of borders. Um, you know, it relates to division, separation, but as you noted. It also relates to mediation, being able to see things um, in certain ways that might not be possible, right? Um, and also a space of ambiguity where contradictions can exist. Um, so I think that's um, it's um, sort of what I thought about uh, when I watched um, your film for the first time. Um, so maybe one last question that we can have before we um, segue into a conversation with the audience is, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, um, so as Ellie noted, um, this film was first screened in Venice in, in last spring, right, in May um, 2019. And it was a two installation, two channel installation piece, and you had to reconfigure it into a single um, channel installation. So I wonder for you, as an artist who works sort of across different mediums and, and sort of um, a multimedia artist, if you can talk about um, if you felt like sort of what were some of the shifts that had to happen um, in order to transform this project into a kind of single channel installation, and if um, you felt like it perhaps offered different meanings um, for you as, as you reconfigured the film? I think it's still so new in a way to, I mean, this is, this is the first time it's shown um, in, in a kind of cinema context. Um, so I guess for me, it's also interesting to see how it works because in, in Venice, um, the viewer would could come in and out at different points, and I think uh, 
different considerations were taken to allow for that. Um, in terms of, I mean, it has a narrative structure for sure, but it's also um, in a way revolving around these recurring uh, ritual moments, for instance. Um, you know, so, so, so it is some, somewhat cyclically evolving. Mm. Uh, and for that, and I guess for the, for the piece as a whole, um, I was thinking a lot about this Germanic ritual uh, and the way that that is um, performed, mm. meaning that um, it, uh, it's often very lengthy and, and you can come in and out in a sense as, as a viewer, you're not really um, mm. expected mm -hmm. to, um, to sit through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so with a single channel viewing, of course, it's, it's very different. it asks different questions, um, you know, to narrative structure. Uh, and so, I don't know, I think it's something that I have done quite a bit in my practice in terms of oftentimes making it for an art exhibition context, but then in different instances, um, also having shown it in film contexts. Uh, and I think it allows for different engagements with, with the audience as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I, I take pleasure in, in both, and I think they offer, offer different experiences. But of course, I mean, for this kind of, uh, it functions in a quite different way from how many cinema films you know, mm -hmm. work narratively. So perhaps it requires a different kind of, of patience or, mm -hmm. Uh, f from the viewer when you see it as a single channel film. Yeah, I was thinking about it as a very particular kind of translation, right? Yeah. Too, as yeah, you're yeah. translating from sort of one context to one context, one medium to another medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe we can actually open this up um, into a broader conversation with the audience. So again, we really welcome questions. Don't be shy. Okay, should I just, oh, so someone will be going around with the microphone. Hi, Jane. Thanks so much for uh, presenting your film here and Crystal for starting up the conversation. Um, I had a question about, there's this one scene where the shaman in Jeju Island is performing a ritual on you. And I was just wondering, it was kind of an intense scene for th me as a viewer, and I was just wondering what was going on in your head? Um, and like, in, also in terms of how much you're aware of the significance or the meaning of what was going on and being performed on you, um, as well as how you would characterize your relationship to shamanism or like the subject matter that you're representing in the film. Mm. Oh, these are great questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it was actually very interesting for me to, to view the film because someone was laughing when she yeah, asked, like, will you translate? <laughs> um, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't expect it to be funny, but I mean, it is, it is funny, right? Um, and uh, I mean, I think, you know, it was a very emotionally intense experience, and I think I understood it on that level. Uh, and then afterwards, also because, I mean, a lot of people who speak Korean fluently will also say that it's very difficult to understand what she's chanting, both because it's it's ritual chant, but also because of um, Jeju dialect, dialect being quite, you know, uh, distinct. Um, so for me, I, I didn't understand a whole lot of the details, um, but I understood the emotional response. Um, so, so there's a kind of delay of comprehension or perhaps that's something, you know, that you understand something uh, sensorily that you might not understand semantically uh, in detail. Um, and so, and I think that's maybe what's, what's fascinating also ab about this Germanic rituals, how I've, I've approached them because it's, it's it's a way that, that knowledge and, and memory and experience is um, conveyed in, in, a, in a different way. You know, it, it allows for um, another um, way of, um, 
of accessing experiences, you know, where it's, it's maybe not about the, uh, you know, historical details, mm -hmm. but it's, it's more about um, being allowed a space for um, a kind of eff effective mm -hmm. um, connection. Um, so, so, so that's part of perhaps like y your question about what my relationship uh, is to shamanism. Mm -hmm. Then I think in, in broader terms, I mean, as, uh, when I started um, becoming interested in, in shamanism in Korea, it was um, mainly through um, an earlier piece I did around the Jeju April 3rd massacre. And because that event was um, very difficult to address for many years, um, one of the few uh, places where people could actually um, mourn the dead was through shamanic rituals. So it, it, played a lot, it played a large mm -hmm. role in the memory work mm -hmm. uh, around that event. Um, and so I think um, I, I see it really as a as a as a practice of of memory of 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 conveying um, uh, memory and and somehow um, also connecting I mean connecting different uh, times and places mm. so I think that's what as as an artist um, fascinates me about the shamanic practice is that it. Um, uh, it's an artistic approach to to very similar things mm -hmm. that I'm dealing with in my work in in different ways, of course. Um, uh, but there's also uh, it's a very refined practice in terms of um, thinking through um, uh, you know how, especially with. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe especially in, in this, this situation w that we were talking about before with um, a situation such as borders or the mm -hmm. division of Korea where um, sometimes lines g can be drawn very strictly between what was past and what is present, but reality is, is uh, a, lot, mm -hmm. a lot more blurry. And, and so something about the way that the shamanic practice uh, diffuses those boundaries um, is maybe um, like enables uh, other forms of coexistences mm -hmm. that are maybe also necessary for um, I don't know for mm -hmm. uh, forms of uh, reconciliation, forms of, of recognition, or mm -hmm. or forms of, of somehow. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Repairing or, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a deeper question. Other questions? Hi, um, thank you for the film. Um, it was really great. And the one scene that I kind of remember is when um, it's like a shot where it's like shooting like two TVs and um, it's showing like how. Um, I think it was like the time when um, Kim Jong Un and like um, South Korean president, they both were kind of like meeting. They were having like a summit, um, and that was kind of like relatable, relatable to me because um, I was like traveling back to Korea um, in like four mm -hmm. years, and before that, I was kind of visiting like Berlin and saw like the walls, mm -hmm. and I was reading about the news like wow that was happening, um, and I guess I. What I was kind of wondering or thinking about think a lot was how um, kind of like historically and politically mm -hmm. that moment, like that like summer 2018 was like a really significant time mm -hmm. in Korean history as well. Mm -hmm. And also I'm kind of like recalling how with like current administration, they also kind of like like acknowledge the um, massacre at the Jeju Island too. Mm -hmm. So kind of finding a lot of relevancy um, in this film, this moment. And mm -hmm. I was kind of curious about your like experience mm -hmm. working kind of in being in that space time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was very, yeah. So that was shot, um, that scene in, in the bus terminal in, in Jeju Island. Uh, 
when when the summit happened um and uh, I was running out and decided to go and and film at the bus terminal because it I mean it was such a public space and people would congregate around the television I mean I think mm -hmm. everywhere in Korea to to watch this this moment um and somehow it was just I think very striking to I mean, to observe people observing, but also observing, mm -hmm. I mean, especially these elderly people in Jeju who, you know, have, have experienced like all these different historical trajectories and then seeing this <laughs> moment of indeterminacy really because it was a summit, but it's, it's, it's not really, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, it is still an open-ended question, mm -hmm. uh, but, but imagining what, mm -hmm. uh, what is going through people's minds? So somehow they're trying to ca capture mm -hmm. um, some of all of these different um, mm -hmm. experiences that people who mm -hmm. were viewing uh, uh, yeah. this this uh, scene or uh, moment. I mean, I think that's so poignant in terms of what you just said, Jane, too. Because I mean, I remember the summit. I think I was actually watching with Patty, maybe, um, and a few other people, but. Um, just knowing that it was such a significant moment, but not quite um, understanding what the aftermath will be like. And I think, especially when it comes to the Korean War and division, there's such a chronicity to it, right, in terms mm -hmm. of, and I think um, one of your narrators was saying in the film, um, even with the DMZ, um, the demilitarized zone, it's a space where you know that war is continuing and yet um, war is also um, suspended, or that sort of this notion of a war that continues but is also suspended, and sort of how do you make sense of that, right, in that sort of literal border area, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is really poignant. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, other questions? Oh, last one. Okay, sorry, last question. Oh, yeah. The mic's coming. Hi, um, thanks for your um, presenting as well. Um, it may be more, uh, more, a qu more of a question beyond the film, but still related. Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, had a chance to visit the mountain Kumgang in North Korea when I was young. Um, and that really gave me a different perspective from the general uh, other perspective that, uh, you know, when the, the new conservative government in South Korea might have came in. So the younger, the newer generation, I would say, are either conservative um, towards North Korea or indifferent to that issue. Um, so I'm more uh, curious about your perspective on you know, the newer generation being indifferent on this uh, the parting um, you know, political situation in the Korean Peninsula. Um, because you know, there has, you're dealing with a like, ton of different historical separation in the Korean Peninsula that had, you know, focusing on the South Korean issue. Um, but you know, unless you have a direct experience with North Korea or the experience of war or being called as, you know, as a communist or a red you know, during those democratization mm -hmm. movements, you won't, there's like single, no single reason for you to get involved in such a, you know, mm -hmm in such an issue. So, you know, as a younger generation, I mean, because of my personal experience, I am very interested in this issue, but for the ones who are not, like, do you have any thoughts about that or any? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I can, I can understand why, you know, the younger generation can sense maybe a, a sense of fatigue around the issue or maybe feel that there are more pressing, uh, for example, social reforms that should happen or, I mean, that, uh, that it can be difficult to understand why this is so important when, you know, one's life is maybe uh, mm -hmm. defined by, you know, being able to enter a good college or, uh, you know, uh, being able to find employment so so i mean the i think the the sentiment is understandable and then at the same time uh, i do think that the um uh, that the division and and also what it um what it produces in terms of militarization or i mean just um you know 
government spend, spending on militarism or all these things, I mean, are, are also effects, mm -hmm. you know, so, so those are maybe, you know, less concrete effects of, of, um, of the situation, but that are also affecting the, I mean, um, affecting everyday mm -hmm. life. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, it's double-sided, I think. I mean, that both it's, it's understandable, the sentiment, but then at the same time, uh, uh, whether one wants it or not, it, mm -hmm. it still um, yeah. affects uh, yeah, the everyday. Yeah, it's like war is everywhere and nowhere at the same time, right, in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was our last question. So thank you so much again for coming out tonight. So much appreciation again for Kilpo.